emerging tech and digital media companies. She has worked for startups and corporates in New York City, Washington, DC, and Berlin, including the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. She's currently VP Business Development for the Kilt Identity Protocol, which is part of the Dot Sama ecosystem. This is to say Polkadot and Kusama because they are um, similar and they're in the same ecosystem. And previously, she was co-founder of the civil media blockchain platform and CMO for Web3 for the Web3 Foundation and the Pol Polkadot. Uh, Christine, it's a really a nice honor to have you here. It's really nice to see your face. Thank you so much. And I'll give you the stage so you can uh, enlighten us with your um, knowledge. Thank you so much. Great. Let me just share my screen. Let me know if you can all see. Let's get back to the beginning. Here we go. Can folks see it? Um, yes, yes, see. everything. I can see. Perfect. It. Okay, great, great. Let me get everything minimized so I can read through it. Okay, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Very excited to speak with your group today. And I've met a number of your team members at various places. I think Davos and uh, Web Summit in Lisbon recently. So happy to um, speak to you a little bit about Web3 and identity, and then just a little bit about Kilt and what we do. Um, and what we're launching soon. So, one second, okay, here we go. Let's start with just, you've probably seen some version of this before, um, the evolution from web one to web two to web three. And the reason I, I start with this um, more recently is that um, there's a lot of buzz around Web3 right now, and, and it's usually around NFTs and metaverse and DAOs, and, which is fantastic. And these are all um, implementations and instances of Web3. But it's also really important to think about the very core part, the mission, the goals, the vision of Web3 and projects that build on Web3 and build on blockchain. And decentralization is key. And that means um, you know, governance by the community, which is a really unique um, and really innovative concept and self-sovereign whether that's owning your data your identity your um, your documents all of that so it's not just the metaverse it's it's a lot more and it's also there's a, um, other misperceptions around um, that web 3 will replace web 2 actually each of them build on each other and i'll show you kind of the value creation that happens in each phase um, there's this misperception that web 2 is free and web 3 will be paid and paid apps and paid sites um, but it's really the utility of the applications you're seeing that's going to make the difference. And then there's been an, even an evolution in the last five, 10 years in blockchain where you started with um, an Ethereum model or Bitcoin and Ethereum. And then we've moved into interoperability. Um, so you see Polkadot and Nier and Cosmos and different chains really focused on interoperability, which is fantastic because uh, this won't scale any other way. Um, just like in the old days of the web, if you only developed and designed for one type of browser, uh, that didn't make a lot of sense and it blocked a lot of adoption. So it's really important that chains can talk to each other and can partner and really build towards mainstream utility and adoption. And now there are much more predictable cost structures. That's one of the reasons we went with Polkadot. And there's real world use cases we're starting to see and identity and storage are a few of those. So um, if you ever wanted to learn a little bit about um, how we get from one to two to three, our founder wrote uh, a blog post a few months ago, the history of Web3 in a nutshell. It's on our Medium um, uh, site. And it really goes through, and, and I hadn't refreshed my own memory and knowledge about this, but it goes from Web 1, um, which is the early days, you know, even pre-internet, pre and talks about like the thin protocols. These were kind of one utility, HTTP, H, um, HTML. And then it had certainly value and it had publishing value, but it was really um, a kind of um, distribution mechanism, a broadcast mechanism. And so when you moved into um, the Web 2 phase, you actually started seeing apps that were building in a lot of interaction, engagement. Those are the main things. It was then kind of a push-pull mechanism. And then you started seeing apps um, being built with very different utilities. So whether it's cloud, payment, um, social media, um, the Ubers of the world. So that's where um, Web2 found its you know, space. And you can measure that from anywhere from like around 2004 to recent years. And then when you look at Web3, you're looking at dApps or decentralized applications. So this is where this idea of a decentralized, you know, no one core owner of a property, it's not um, an, a monopoly, it's an entity that is um, open source usually. 
And so you start to see these really interesting um, tools being built. You start to see um, FAP protocols. They do more than one thing. Uh, so computation takes a whole new level, ownership, storage. You start to see IPFS, decentralized storage. You see a lot of DeFi applications. And then you start to see some things around identity. So we've launched a few things called DidSign and Social KYC. So that's kind of this value creation really starts growing. And if you look also um, at the difference or the things that uh, Web3 brings to the fore, you begin to look into this um, tokenomics. So these Web3 services are not companies, they're networks. They are owned and operated by the community of token holders. So by buying a token or utility coin, you actually become a member of the community, almost like a stakeholder, like you own stock in a public company. And it's also expected um, that you should take part in the governance. So each of them, including Kilt, including Polkadot, we all have our own governance structures. We have places, um, um, you know, Poke Assembly is a really interesting uh, polka dot um, governance structure where you can actually see motions and voting. And it's really determining the direction of the network. It's where polka dot is going, you know, it's deciding what technologies, what partnerships, and it really gets the community involved. Um, and then you have things like councils that will make really core decisions um, for the direction of the technology. And so all of this is really building in innovation in a way that wasn't possible before. In Web 2, when you have really um, fast growing companies, you know, the Googles and the Facebooks of the world, they really um, deter any type of innovation in the later years, you know, very, very difficult for a small company to come along. Um, perfect example right now is, is social media, right? Many people have moved off Facebook for different reasons. Meta seems stalled for a lot of different reasons. And now Twitter, it, will it survive the next year or so? Very hard to tell, um, very hard to see if they'll be able to continue maintaining that network um, with a much smaller staff and different leadership. So you wonder where do we go next, right? And so people are speculating what sites, but there are no other big contenders. There aren't any even medium contenders, medium sized social networks right now, um, because it didn't make sense to go into that business. There was no way you're going to break into that, that the ad models, the business models were, were really owned by these, um, you know, a handful of companies. So the idea that Web3 networks, applications, dApps can be really iterated quickly, funded by the community, owned and operated means that you can move really quickly and try new business models and really try to drive adoption. So uh, let's see. So to start um, framing uh, some of these Web3 dApps and utilities, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about ide um, identity, which digital identity is becoming a bit of a hot topic. Um, we're hearing more and more about it, especially now that um, some governments are starting to be getting, um, starting to launch or starting to talk about national identity systems that they want to um, roll out in the coming years. And so when we talk, um, about Kilt and about Web3 and, you know, being able to control your own identity, um, self-sovereign control of your identity. We really start with what is identity in the physical world, because a lot of folks, um, when you, you know, when someone asks for an ID, you actually show them like your your driver's license, your um, your passport, and and we say it's even your ID, um, but it's not your identity. These are actually credentials. Your identity is made up of two things: identifiers, which are things that are inherent to you, so your face, your fingerprint, your signature. These things were made by you and not um, issued to you from a government or a corporation or say a department of motor vehicles and then when you add credentials to these which are issued by a trusted entity maybe your university issues you the, the uh, diploma um, you have control over these that's what's the beauty of, of physical digital ass, um, digital physical identity it's that it's worked for hundreds of years you um, had your documents your diplomas maybe in your wallet or your drawer um, you decided when to show them and to who and it was very scalable and very privacy preserving so if you walk into a bar you um, you know you don't the government doesn't know that you've walked in and shown your ID and um, it also, um, it's, you can show then your age and that gets you into the um, establishment. So what Kilt is trying to do and a lot of identity protocols um, that are decentralized are actually trying to bring these very basic ideas for physical identity into the digital world.
But unfortunately, um, Web2, um, in its massive and rapid growth, has really destroyed digital identity along the way. It does not uphold these standards. You do not hold your credentials in your hand. You actually have to, when you use like um, a Google Auth or a sign-in service that immediately shows you, a, um, you get a page or a pop-up saying, do you want to sign in with Facebook, Google, Apple, Amazon, whatever the choice is. Each time you do that, you are giving away a piece of yourself. You are letting this middleman take your data, throw it in their um, databases, monetize it, scrape it, save it for however knows how long. Um, and then they are the gatekeeper to get you into the online service or the app that you want. So it's really important in the idea of a digital identity and a blockchain service is to take away that middleman. And then rather than storing all of your data, it would store a hash or a representation that this data is accurate, store that on the blockchain. So that way there isn't a third party saving this data and there isn't a blockchain entity like Kilt saving it. It is all a hash of it is saved on the blockchain. But we can talk about that in a bit. So the other thing that's important to know is that um, with the EU's um, IDIS uh, initiative they've been talking about, it's, it started um, coming into the fore about two years ago, and they've got another two years or so to roll it out, and it's going to include wallets. Um, these are following much more of a centralized model. There's only a few um, countries that are actually talking about using uh, blockchain for this. So what the governments are doing, what Web2 has done, is actually, again, the middleman, where you are the user, you want to use a service, that needs to verify who you are. So you sign in with the service and they hold your keys, they hold uh, your data and, um, and you don't really know what they're doing with it. And you actually have no way to really delete it off their system, that's pretty difficult. So a Web3 model for digital identity is literally user-centric. The user is in the middle, you hold your keys, you hold your credentials, you add them, um, maybe through a wallet, and you grow your identity this way, and you decide how to parcel out that information, whether it's your age, household income, email address, nationality. And so you can also, at any given point in this um, digital identity transaction, you can store and then a verifier can check the validity of your information on the blockchain. So another important part to think about is standardization, that we have you know, many different uh, models for identity. We've got a lot of different projects um, working in digital identity. And so about five years ago, the Decentralized Identity Foundation was formed, about 300 companies, um, a consortium of large and small startups and more you know, Fortune 100 companies like Microsoft and IBM, and then some blockchain uh, large um, entities like Consensus. Uh, all came together to, to basically decide what would be the standards for um, digital identity protocols to follow. And by doing so, you're actually moving towards a more interoperable, more scalable structure, rather than having you know, each um, entity, each app have a different way that it actually records um, and tracks and um, builds identity models. So just this summer, um, the uh, World Wide Web Consortium, the W3C, also the folks behind um, standardizing uh, HTTP and HTML um, structures, um, officially did realize um, DIDs, which are decentralized identifiers, um, or your digital fingerprint, that this is now an official standard and that folks working in this space should really um, follow these standards. So let's talk a little bit about um, the different structures of the digital identity. So uh, as I mentioned, this has become now the standard that most models start with a DID, which is like a digital fingerprint. Um, it's, what's interesting here is that it's created through cryptographic techniques. So it's verifiable, you can prove ownership or a verifier can prove that this is you. And then again, it is decentralized. So it's not, um, you know, it's not going back to a centralized uh, entity, to a government or whatever, to check that this is actually you. So this is um, really a holistic approach to uh, digital identity. And then uh, we have verifiable credentials. So that's the other piece. We talked about the identifiers and now we're talking about the credentials piece. So these would be, again, like in the physical world, they would be issued and signed by a physical um, trusted entity um, that is often you know, kind of in the business of, of issuing um, credentials, whether that's uh, your license, your diploma, um, and then you also have the freedom and the autonomy of keeping ownership of this credential. 
So you can store it in a digital wallet. Um, you can use it um, and you can use um, what we call selective disclosure. So if you decide that you want to sign in to a certain service, um, say it's maybe a premium news website, uh, they really might only need your email address. So rather than signing in with a Facebook authorization or a Google, which might share multiple pieces of your identity, um, you would just say, okay, this service only needs my email address. So I'm going to use uh, my credentials that just shows my, my email address. They don't need to know my gender, household income, my age. Um, there's just the one piece that you share. And then, um, each of these uh, attributes that you have that are verified by the credentials um, are linked to a DID. And this DID is unique to you. It's your digital fingerprint. And then um, that verifier can then say, okay, do I trust the issuer here? If I'm doing KYC, do I trust that um, if a you know, big four accounting firm um, issued the certificate, issued and said you were um, approved for KYC, do I trust them? So again, it's going back to that trust model that's very um, uh, inherent to a physical uh, identity. And you can also, again, check that um, validity against the blockchain. And again, it's that hash, it's immutable, so you can't um, change it uh, backwards. It actually, once you've done the credential and locked it to the blockchain, it remains there. So specifically, how do we take all of these components for digital identity and actually build services out of them that consumers and enterprise can use? Uh, so again, we are trying to tap into all of these trust models um, in ways that are recognizable to users and that make sense to them and bring a little bit of ease of use to their daily life. And we're also tapping, um, you can create your DIDs and your credentials and verify them through Kilt, through our different services. But it's also important to remember that um, anything can have an identity. So, um, you know, you've got obviously humans, machines, uh, pets. We have a couple of um, community members who are um, interested in working on like an RFID tag and creating identities for their pets, which actually makes quite a bit of sense. Um, you can use them for services, obviously. You can use them for things like uh, NFTs. So we um, created a concept called an asset DID um, earlier this year. And that's actually a way to assign a DID, this digital fingerprint, to an NFT and, um, and a cross chain. So what happens now in the NFT world is that you could actually have um, a string that could be you know, one string on Ethereum, very different string on Polkadot or a different chain. And so this asset DID would assign one very unique DID to this um, NFT, to this asset, and that it would actually help prevent counterfeit across the different chains. So there's really interesting ways you can use DIDs across many different types of verticals and types of Web3 um, initiatives and innovations. So it's basically anything that needs an identity could have a DID and could exist in the digital world. And so uh, when we talk about um, the different chains and the different um, benefits of building on, um, you know, you've probably heard of the Ethereum and there's Cosmos and Near and Polygon and Avalanche, and they all have different um, benefits and different opportunities for builders, for consumers, for different apps being built on them. Uh, for Kilt, we went with Polkadot. Um, we actually started building um, the first iterations or the first ideas around what the Kilt identity identity blockchain would be, starting with um, Substrate, which is kind of a, a building block um, that's part in the same framework as Polkadot. Um, it means that um, Polkadot has this innovation called parachains, um, which are parallel chains. So if you are designing your blockchain and you want it to focus on just storage or just NFTs or just metaverse, um, we call that a purpose-built blockchain. It's one focus. And so um, Parachains and Polkadot in particular are really, really um, built for this, designed for this. And so you can focus on what your specialty is, what your utility is, and then you can tap Polkadot's what's called a relay chain or a central mechanism, well, not exactly centralized, but a core mechanism for security. Um, so that really lets your developers focus on building those special feature sets around your identity protocol, for instance, and then relying on this relay chain to provide security to each of the parachains that form the um, kind of hub and spoke um, structure of Polkadot. So it's a really unique um, process. 
And the other benefit of building on an ecosystem um, like Polkadot, so there's probably over 100 parachains by now, and they can all work together. They're interoperable, same core code base, all relying on relay chain, which means you can then decide which uh, partners across the ecosystem make the most sense. So for us, we are talking to NFT pro um, protocols. We're talking with a few metaverse folks. We're already building with um, one of them. We are talking with storage, DeFi, folks working with DEXs. Obviously, you know, identity is universal. There's a ton of applications uh, for Kilt. And it really helps that we can tap into the Polkadot ecosystem for these partnerships. And then we also um, are reaching out to um, beyond Polkadot to other chains, to Ethereum. We're going to have one of our um, services actually uh, accept Ethereum um, wallet addresses. So it's really important in the long term to be able to scale and to be able to offer as much functionality and um, flexibility as you can. So excuse me for one second. Still finding a cold in the, the raw rainy days of Berlin here. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the other part about Polkadot that's important is it's one of the, um, it was ranked this year as one of the lowest um, energy and electricity consumption. And so, of course, that's important. Um, that was true of Polkadot to begin with, but then um, over time, it's actually even become more refined. And so that's really important. And that's important for enterprise and, and it's important for consumers. So, as a result of building and um, within this ecosystem, as I said, it's scalable, it's efficient for companies um, because Polkadot has a predictable um, transaction costs. It doesn't fluctuate by day like maybe an Ethereum does. While we are talking to enterprises who might want to use Polkadot or might want to use Kilt, we can actually show them that no, you don't have to. You can actually build a business model, build um, a case for building with Kilt, building with one of these pro um, protocols because you can then predict what your cost would be for a given product over a year or five years or 10 years, which is obviously really important to building any business. You have to know what your costs are going to be. So it's efficient in that way. And then again, it is um, interoperable across other chains. So the other piece, um, we talked about standardization and the importance of that. It's also important when your ecosystem is growing rapidly that you still make sure that you are upholding open source um, culture that, um, for instance, there were there were some uh, projects that were unfortunately um, borrowing or stealing code from other projects and not attributing that code. We're open source, so of course you can use our code, you can use code of the other protocols and the other projects within the ecosystem, but you have to attribute it. You can't um, build a wallet and scrape all the code and, and then you know uh, put it out as yours. That's not cool within our, um, within our code of ethics for open source and blockchain. So uh, just this week, uh, we announced that um, the, the formation of what we're calling the Polkadot Alliance. So Kilt was a founding member along with um, six other teams in the ecosystem. A lot of us have been building together and as part of Polkadot for a number of years. And again, with any kind of fast growing um, industry, whether that's tech in general, internet, uh, you know, web-based or blockchain-based, the more um, capital and the more buzz around an industry, um, the more you have people coming in that might want to just make money and not necessarily build utility and build um, uh, products that people can use and benefit from. So there were a couple of projects that were using the Polka brand. So they were Polka X, Polka Y. They just used that brand. Maybe they got um, a grant from our foundation, but they never really built anything. And they just used um, you know, the name and the brand and that kind of brand halo effect to uh, raise funds. And um, there's many, obviously, uh, not great reasons or, or um, negative consequences of that. Um, but it's also really important that as people decide whether they want to um, support and contribute to an ecosystem by maybe um, uh, buying and supporting the coin, uh, or maybe they want to partner with projects, um, it's really important that they can trust that if it's a Polkadot brand, it says it's built on Polkadot, that it's a certain level of quality, because obviously Polkadot is a very, very um, respected and very advanced um, blockchain technology. So it's important that people can trust it. It's important that people uh, know that this is um, within an ecosystem 
that they can count on um, that are actually building and executing and also for all of us within the ecosystem as it grows we need to keep attracting quality projects and so you know our first um the easiest and quickest thing to do is build with each other and then that that network effect of having two or three projects incorporating each other's technology and building from there and building new projects and new layers and new function functionalities um, so if you're having low quality projects come in, um, that's not going to help any of us. Uh, it's, it means your, your choices to partner and to grow the ecosystem um, actually shrink. So we want to make sure that we are rapidly growing, but we're doing that in a quality way. So this um, alliance is a little bit uh, different. I haven't really heard about them being formed in other ecosystems quite yet. Um, but there will be governance um, as part of this that uh, there will be fellows, um, founders, and then there will be allies, so a project can um, either be nominated into the group or it can apply into the group. And they have to show that they have um, a sustained, continued interest and um, proof points that they are contributing to the ecosystem, whether that's through education, building solid projects, um, building awareness, uh, helping with development and infrastructure. And you don't necessarily have to be a core parachain. You can also be a service that is supporting um, other chains through things like analytics, storage, all of that. So anything that supports the future success of the ecosystem um, is eligible to become a member. So really exciting. And we're thrilled to be part of the uh, beginning of this initiative. It's, it's core to the um, success, success long term. And so um, when we talk about also um, kind of this this quality effect of who we work with, we want to make sure that we are working with um, both within blockchain and getting projects executed and live. And we also want to make sure that we're working with enterprise and government that um, as you know, we're able to move pretty quickly in blockchain, you have smaller teams, it's fast technology, we're able to test and iterate pretty quickly. And when you go and you partner with a government entity, it can take a little bit longer, but it actually has um, an equal or larger effect that you are bringing your technology into, um, into these initiatives that will then have end consumers. In this case, we partnered with um, Dana, which is the federal um, agency in Germany for the energy. A ministry and so they uh, were working with a consortium of both um, large publications large uh, entities um, both in the kind of web 2 space um, sap for instance and then web 3 so parity which is the technology arm for polka dot uh, energy web foundation which is a, a very um, successful web 3 entity as well that we partner with and so it's really important to have that mix. And for them, as you walk into um, meetings and initiatives with government, with enterprise, to help them see the value of decentralization, which can be a little maybe off-putting to an entity that is used to having maybe oversight into the data um, and how they roll out uh, their services. Um, certainly, um, digitization is a hot topic in, in recent years. Um, both on the enterprise and the government side, and especially since COVID um, has certainly slowed down a lot of delivery of government services. They're looking for ways to ramp up, get things moving quickly again. And there's been a lot of research that, you know, incorporating things like digital identity um, campaigns and, and programs into different government um, services could even increase um, GDP. So it's it's uh, a way to um, kind of jumpstart some of these initiatives, bring them new technologies and bring them into new marketplaces. And so for this one specifically, it was about um, machine identity. So um, assigning and providing digital identities to energy generating devices. And it was a very exciting um, initiative for us to be part of. But there's also the flip side. Uh, sometimes as I mentioned, um, government initiatives might uh see the success of some of these um, web 2 entities that collected a lot of data that were able to mine it and then maybe create other services um, and so as folks like the eu get into um, digital identity uh, unfortunately it seems that they're moving in the direction of actually not only just um, managing your credentials but also your identifiers. And so if those are combined into a database that is um, managed by government, there's quite a few um, issues there or potential um, dangers. 
if the government is storing your data like this, um, there's nothing to say that they wouldn't delete it at some time, right? Or certainly it could be hacked. You know, we're not talking about a small identity service provider that might have hundreds or thousands of users. We're talking about millions of users. And so these hacks, um, that's a, that's a, uh, a honeypot for hackers, as we say, that if someone can go in and with the same amount of effort hack into a small identity app or a large government um, entity and benefit by having, you know, millions of um, data points, that's dangerous. And also, um, you have to factor in regime change that perhaps uh, a government that's pretty democratic would um, initiate a digital identity program, but then maybe in two, five, ten years, uh, a different regime or a political party might come to the forefront that might not have the same um, ethical guidelines. Uh, they might start using this data to make some decisions um, if they don't like, for instance, your religion, your activism, your sexual preference. So you have to, as you start hearing about these government initiatives, think about the identity or the, the government makeup of the people who are collecting it now, but also think about the future and who the data could, you know, whose hands it could fall into in the future. All these things are important and they're not really being talked about. Um, uh, I'll explain, I think on the next slide, um, what a couple of different countries are doing so far. But I'm basically saying, you know, put yourself on alert as you start to hear your country start talking about um, government identity uh, programs, digital identity uh, collection. It is um, for the EU in particular, that's about 27 countries and, and a few more, so 30 all in, that would be using um, a, a fairly interactive um, type of program. However, uh, the second phase would include wallets. And um, building a wallet is not easy. Building an interoperable wallet with you know, 29 other companies is even more difficult. And then again, if we're talking about centralized databases and these are being stored on either in the cloud that's managed by a government entity, again, this is becoming quite um, an interesting uh, and valuable place to hack. And so it's not just the how they're collecting it, um, it's how they're storing it. And it's also the storage of your keys. So you've heard probably the phrasing, you know, not your keys, not your coins, so that it's important that, um, you know, you, that you don't necessarily store your coins on um, centralized exchanges, that you should have your own cold wallets, that type of thing. It's the same with credentials. If you don't own them and have them in your hands and your control, then you're not really sure how they're being used. Um, Japan announced um, fairly recently, a few months ago, that they would be um, uh, requiring digital ID by 2024, and national um, their healthcare insurance um, programs are going to be uh, linked to this identity and these digital cards. Um, they will no longer um, accept uh, the, the more typical, um, you know, medical card used to showing. And so the danger there is they may present, prevent or limit access for those people who do not um, move over to the digital identity system. So again, it's um, when you have a government that is getting involved in like e-signatures and healthcare and maybe paying your taxes, these types of things, it's, it's really um, becomes a bit of a concern as they start bringing this all into a, what's becoming a centralized wallet structure. South Korea is um, one of the few that has come out saying they will use blockchain technology. Um, unfortunately, one of their first um, instances of the program was uh, for um, something like um, an app that you could board um, a plane with your government app. And again, that's not true digital identity, but it also means that someone else is collecting that data. They're also doing mobile um, uh, driver's licenses. Again, they're partnering with a technology company. So again, have to think about with each of these solutions by country, are there middlemen? And if there are, that means that they aren't being stored necessarily, or a portion of the data isn't being stored to the blockchain. It's potentially in a centralized database. And as we've talked about, there are many, many um, challenges and potential dangers to that. So it's it's almost like, just like digitization, just like going online, you know, 10, 20 years ago, um, companies might have said they were doing it, um, but they don't necessarily follow through to the last mile in keeping the tenets and the mission of decentralization and self-sovereignty within their program start to finish. So, um, again, we talked about this, that uh, 
this is the, the, the biggest danger. It's that, um, that these government databases are going to be uh, very, very um, attractive. And uh, whereas if you are using uh, a kill protocol or another identity protocol, it's your one wallet. They would have to hack your wallet and then another wallet and then another wallet. And yes, maybe there's interesting credentials I have in my wallet and maybe some interesting kilt coins, but they have to 10X that on a 100X it um, to actually uh, gain the same uh, amount they would by doing uh, one hack in a government. So, uh, in terms of services and why um, identity solutions are becoming more attractive, not just to government, but also to enterprise, um, there are some things um, in terms of uh, uh, identity solutions that um, can actually help um, with the, the basic kind of business um, front end or front of the store, back of the store operations. So um, there are ways that you can use Kilt or identity solutions to minimize onboarding, um, minimize your data storage, increase user privacy, which is very important for, for consumers and then obviously important to the enterprise as well. So what we've been introducing in recent uh, months are um, services that are built on Kilt. So one of them is around reusable credentials. So for instance, if you've ever gone onto um, Dex or you've you've used exchanges or even you know regular banking processes, you have to um, do a KYC each time. You have to work with a trusted entity that provides you the credentials in the process that I described before. Maybe it's an accounting firm that's attesting that you are KYC'd. You you've gone through a KYC and AML process, but you can only use that once. You know it might be a small cost to you to go through that process, and you have to go you know sign on, do the video, prove that you are you, show your passport, all of this, and it takes time. Um, and then it's a little bit nerve wracking maybe for people who are not used to going through this process. Same thing with a bank. You know I had to go through. Um, uh, selling a company recently in the US and I had to go to each of the banks and then you have to use your KYC and go through each of the processes there and the paperwork and it was still physical paperwork, which is crazy. Um, but it's just very onerous and that means also time and resources and money spent on the company side. And so these types of identity solutions, reusable credentials actually um, really streamlines the process. It's much more ease of use. It makes the, um, the user happier as well. And it's also actually another way to move into new businesses for for the um, the verifier that they can actually then charge a little bit more for a reusable credential and it just speeds up the process overall. So the other thing we talked about was data storage. Um, GDPR, um, I'm, I'm always amazed. I moved from the US to, to Berlin to Europe a few years ago. And GDPR is just so much more um, uh, paid attention to and so much more of a focus, um, uh, controlling data, user privacy, much more of a focus. It's, it's slowly, slowly coming to the forefront in the US, but um, we at Kilt are speaking with a number of media companies who, um, you know, in the last, as media companies went online, um, they uh, and were going to a more kind of engaged model. They wanted to have a more extensive relationship with their readers and their users. And so um, I used, you know, came from uh, the New York Times. So in 2000, when I started there, we were um, one of the first to do a registration model. And so you would actually enter at the point. Um, back then, it was probably on your email address that the New York Times wanted to be able to contact you. Maybe they wanted to send you or you would sign up for a newsletter. Um, but over time, uh, many media companies added more data points to that. Um, so you would maybe need, as, you, as a new user, to sign up with name, email address, household income, zip code, gender, um, and then over time, maybe some some interests so they could target um, ads to you. This was in the beginning um, phases of uh, ad tech and ad servers and targeting. And so over the last 10 years, many media companies have kind of entered into the um, into the data game and that meant more databases. Um, if you've ever worked for a large media company or any large corporation, you know that things can be stored across the company under different managers, under different um, maybe data practices. And so under GDPR, you have the ability to request your data and, ha and be have it confirmed that you is, you've been deleted off the database, which is actually a really resource intensive um, task for many companies. And so when we um, go and explain uh, how Kilt works to a media company, how you could use um, one of our services to sign in to their, um, perhaps they're a premium you've paid to use a different website. 
you could actually just as a user show them one data point and then they wouldn't have to store that. It would be stored a hash of it, the information on Kilt, and uh, they wouldn't be responsible and wouldn't have to um, pay or worry about the data storage. There's, there's reduced risks in terms of hacking, et cetera. So that's another use case um, on the enterprise side for Kilt. And then um, again, uh, enterprises definitely want to see that you're using uh, industry standards. And then um, we were also trying to make, uh, because we believe that identity and digital identity is really important um, for mainstream users, when you sign up and you create your DID on our wallet, and I'll show you that in a minute, um, you actually need to pay a deposit of two kilt. And so that means that you need to somehow buy kilt on an exchange, and it means that you would need to go through a KYC process and buy kilt and then use it on our system, um, which is great. And some people understand how to do that and they're comfortable with that. But for folks who maybe have not gone through um, buying online and buying um, cryptocurrency, or maybe after the recent press with what's going on with FTX and some of the exchanges and the news that you hear, maybe not as comfortable, maybe you don't want to do that, or you're not ready to do it yet, but you still want to use a DID and you still want to use um, it to sign into different services. So we're building um, what's called a fiat on-ramp. So basically, when you go through the process, you can either decide to pay with a deposit of Kilt coins, or you can decide to pay, for instance, with PayPal. And so we'll be wrapping that into our website in January and launching then. And we're really focusing um, our whole, it's a redesign of our website and our process to really um, help you build your digital identity. Um, and protect it and add different services onto it and create a DID and start becoming familiar with this concept of a digital identity and, and how you can actually exert more control over your data than is possible with most Web2 services. And then, um, if, but with this fiat on-ramp, which is great for consumers, again, you don't necessarily have to go through the process of, of buying crypto. But also um, crypto taxes, uh, that can be difficult from the accounting, you know, back office perspective. So uh, a fiat on ramp um, where an enterprise, a large company could pay with um, euro, for instance, that actually makes their accounting teams quite happy too. So all of this is really designed to um, deliver utility to consumers, deliver, you know, new marketplaces, new business opportunities, new products to enterprise. And that's been our core focus. So if you look, if you go to kilt.io, um, you'll see that we have about five services um, live. One of them's not here, it's our staking board, but that's more for folks who are um, uh, on, the, on the dev side. But um, you can also stake Kilt coins like many coins, and that's a nice um, uh, little revenue stream that a lot of consumers are starting to learn about. So if you've never heard about staking coins, I would say uh, check it out. And yet it's another way to help secure um, and get involved with the project. So we have a wallet that we've built. And so it's like a physical wallet and then you can put your coins there, your Kilt coins, your tokens, um, your currency. And then also it has the ability to store your credentials there. And also then you can create your DIDs, you can store your credentials, you can decide um, to sign transactions with your DID. Um, and I'll show you that through DidSign. And then social KYC is uh, interesting in that, um, you know, many influencers, people who live and, and work um, online, they need to be able to prove that they are the person they are, that they have control over their account. Maybe they um, want to prove that they own uh, the, the data and they control their account on Twitter or on Instagram or YouTube. And so using social KYC, you can actually, again, um, get a credential for that and use it across different services. Web3 name, uh, when I showed you the, the long string of letters and numbers that form your DID or your digital footprint, uh, fingerprint, um, this is a way to actually uh, customize your DID into a more kind of human readable, brandable name. So for instance, um, I registered and claimed the name Christine. I also did Christine Mohan. Some people will decide to claim their company name and then you can actually sign and be identified um, with that name across um, the different uh, Web3 services that you use. And then I'll show you um, a mock-up, uh, uh, actually not a mock-up, a screen grab. Um, all these services are live. Um, we launched them starting a year ago. Uh, Kilt launched as a um, parachain uh, a year ago in November, and then we uh, moved on to Polkadot. And so over the course of the last year, we've been testing and um, launching and iterating these uh, four or five services. And 
This is uh, the social KYC service. So um, KYC is standing for like know your customer. Uh, and it's for proving that you control these. It's also um, when you go through the service, um, we use an API that confirms with Twitter that you know you actually have to tweet something that shows you control it. And then we actually on the social KYC side, Kilt would forget about the user after you've done that. It's issued your credential, you've put that credential into your wallet. You now have control over it and um, the data is not being stored. So there's another um, nice application for social KYC with gaming in that um, you know, gamers can often uh, need to prove who they are, they need to prove their potential, um, their history, their gaming records. Um, so it's a reputation layer, they could use it for that. They could use it as an authentication layer. So we are working with a Polkadot um, metaverse and gaming partner called Moonsama. And so when you go to the first screen to enter the game or enter the metaverse, you can either sign in using your um, Microsoft or Minecraft, or you can use social KYC to say, this is me and this is my identity on this game. So it actually, and then you could use it also for things like if there is an age um, requirement or um, structure like for esports or kids sports, it could also be used for something like that. Um, so it actually helps improve um, also cheating. So we learned this as we got into um, the gaming use case that uh, folks will often, uh, gamers can rapidly um, upscale through a game and uh, if you started doing that and, and getting the rewards and getting the reputation, if you did it consistently across many games, there would be a way to identify that you've been doing this with a certain identity and um, maybe you would be um, penalized for that. So, And then also it's again GDPR compliant that you are um, using your email to sign in through social KYC and then the actual service doesn't have to store a lot of uh, your information to uh, open up that service to you. And then we have uh, did sign. So this is something, you know, each of our services kind of one led to the other, and now they they work almost like logos um, that they do or Legos rather. <laughs> Uh, that they do fit together, that you can now um, get your Spore on wallet and create your on-chain DID, and then you can use that, then use social KYC to add credentials. So I, in my wallet, I have my email address, my Twitter um, credential, and my, uh, I think I also have my Discord credential in there. And then what I can do is use did sign uh, to sign a transaction or sign a file. And so the way this works, you can see what it looks like on the left, or you can just go to didsign.io. And it's basically a Web3 approach to document signing. We've all probably used um, another Web2 um, platform to sign documents, sign your contracts. Um, this is actually interesting for a number of ways. It's free once you've um, purchased your, or your deposit for the two kilt. Um, you can sign and send and, and do whatever you like um, with this um, with the service. You can sign as many files as you like. It's not just PDFs, it's any type of file. So that gets interesting when you can actually uh, sign research, you could sign software, you could sign audio and video files, and then of course your typical PDFs and, and documents. And the reason that that is interesting um, to different types of verticals, for instance, um, media. Uh, so we were talking with one media company that has a lot of reporters and videographers in the field in Ukraine, for instance. And with fake news and misinformation, they really need to know that this is valid, verifiable uh, video files. So when the reporter, um, they, they shoot, they then take their video and they throw it through did sign, they verify and sign it, and then they can send it however they like. They could sign it through Telegram, they could send it through WhatsApp, they could send it through Signal, they could send it through email. Again, a lot of flexibility in what you're using. And depending on how sensitive this content or file is, maybe you wanna use something like Signal. And so you can actually then sign, send it to your um, editor. The editor then takes the file, drags it into this did sign um, screen, and then it pops up green. It's verified. Here's the signature, the long string. And then if I have a Web3 name, it actually says signed by W3N Christine Mohan. And then I can actually add some other service endpoints, some other credentials to that, so they know that this is me on Twitter, this is my email, this is really Christine who shot this in the field, and you're able to then retrieve it and know that no one has changed it and no one has tampered with the file. 
And it's also um, interesting from, uh, we have a, a medical partner that's interested in using it for lab reports. So it's all done browser to browser. There's nothing stored. And so, you know, some of the more um, maybe larger conglomerates or, or entities like government, like healthcare, um, they have fairly clink, clunky infrastructure. With something like this, you could sign doctor to doctor, that a doctor could request a lab report another doctor could sign it within the, the medical system and it could be sent back very quickly without um, certainly with all the protections um, with security but it would be very quick and browser to browser so also attractive um, for other industries like that so check it out it's very easy to use and um, it's it's kind of basically going towards that goal we have of, of very simple utility that um, simplifies what you're doing, that does it in a decentralized way, that also keeps the information and the data in your hands. And so that's it for me. Um, I hope, I don't know if I'm able to take questions for this platform or through the chat, but I'd be happy to do so. Of course you will. I will uh, Yay. <laughs> we'll, uh, look at them, of course, and um, I will uh, well, ask you. Thank you so much uh, for being with us, Christine. Thank you for all the enlightening well things that you showed as well. I well, let's start with one of my questions, I suppose, and then you can go there. The DID sign, right? You yes. sign documents, but can you sign videos? Uh, and I will tell you why I'm asking this. Yes, yes. So you can sign video. So you... I'm asking this because then you could also theoretically uh, fight deep fakes with it as well, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. So if, um, for instance, the reporter, um, it was somehow intercepted when it was sent, um, it would actually show up when you when the editor drags it in, it would it would not verify it would it would flag that this someone else has has touched or viewed or or configured that video. So yes, it could help with deep fakes. Okay, great. Uh, let's ask other, uh, let's see if other people have also questions, of course. I have a few of my own as well, but of course, let's ask uh, the, the, <laughs> the participants and the students. Um... So I'm actually seeing one of the questions about KYC. So if yes. the KYC is owned by the user, how can we perform anti-money laundering? So the AML. So basically, um, and one of our partners that we will announce in probably January is um, actually using um, Kilt uh, identity solutions for um, KYC. So they would be the trusted entity that would issue the KYC. Um, they might work with, say, an exchange, um, and they would be able to, um, in kind of a triangular fashion, that you would work with the exchange, the exchange would then work with the potential trusted entity or accounting firm, and then Kilt would then store a hash of that credential so that the exchange does not have to store it. So all of the verification steps are still there you have still proven that you are in a region that can participate in this activity. Um, but Kilt does not, does not store the full information and the, um, the bank or the, um, the, the DEX or the exchange does not um, hold the full thing. So it's really about um, going through that process flow where um, moving forward exchanges and, and decentralized exchanges will need to show and will need to start following more compliant measures. Um, but they, again, do not want to store the data for all the reasons we talked about. But you would still have that trusted entity that is part of that process. Um, and it actually opens up new markets to potential trusted entities as well. Mm -hmm. So, but yes, um, regulatory compliance is key to all of this and more and more um, DeFi and DEXs will need to um, be introducing and, and upholding this, um, in, especially in the next year. So um, Victor also asks, Christine, is Kilt interoperable with other chains from Ethereum to XRP, Stellar, Bitcoin, Binance Smart Chain, or is it only interoperable within the services of the Polkadot ecosystem? Good question. So right now we are interoperable with the Polkadot ecosystem. And um, what we will be opening up is the Web3 name. Um, so the ability to set up your digital identifier a string is right now um, attached to, or if you have a Polkadot address, a Polkadot wallet, you're active within the Polkadot ecosystem, you could use it. 
Our next step coming in Q1 is actually to then open that up to Ethereum wallets and Ethereum addresses. So you could then use the service, use your um, Web3 name, that brandable kind of very human readable name across um, Ethereum projects as well. But yes, it's a step-by-step -step thing. I see. Another question is, uh, this could seem to me like updates cannot easily be done once a digital identity data is stored. What happens when, a, when an update is required? I'm sorry, so you mean an update to a credential? Um, or I suppose so. That's the question. <laughs> so sure. I'm just uh, so, reading it yes. out loud. Yes. I, um, so, so the other interesting thing about um, digital identity and kilt, um, kilt credentials um, in particular are that the credentials are revocable. So um, say that I've put my government ID, my driver's license into um, my wallet, and I start using it for, um, you know, for different services. If someone asks for my um, license for whatever reason, like, you know, down the road, maybe, um, you know, uh, cars and, and Ubers and all these types of services um, would accept a kill credential and I could use my, my wallet um, to prove that I have this uh, driver's license. But if um, the government entity that uh, granted that to me um, is maybe, unfortunately, I somehow lost the license or I didn't um, keep up with my uh, driver's license tests and it expired, um, that credential the next time I tried to use it to sign into a service or use a product, it actually would show that it was no longer viable. So it's revocable in that way. The, the government has revoked it. It's still in your wallet. It's just no longer um, valid. So it, it's still um, keeping all those important um, blockchain inherent rules that we're not going back and changing a record. But if for some reason something expires and it's revoked, then that credential would no longer work. Wonderful. Um, Vikas also asks, what is the weakest link in a decentralized digital identity, uh, if there is one? Sure, sure. It's the human. <laughs> so um, you have to remember, okay, so with each freedom comes responsibility, right? So if you are going to own your data, if you are going to participate in a decentralized marketplace, if you're going to um, purchase and hold uh, tokens and crypto, you need a digital wallet, you need um, a seed phrase, You there is a different type of security mechanism that keeps your crypto safe. So with our digital wallet, with Sporon, with most digital wallets, you may might use or have heard of MetaMask, which is um, the Ethereum uh, uh, digital wallet. Um, these are, uh, it's a new process. So you would need to write down your seed phrase. You would have a password. So everyone is used to the typical kind of, you know, login, username and password. There is another layer that protects your crypto and protects your identity um, when you move across Web3 services and when you, you know, buy and sell crypto. And so a seed phrase is 12 randomly generated words. And so you need to write those down as part of your signing on um, to a new, maybe you're starting a new account on Kraken or an exchange, or you're opening your wallet and starting your wallet um, that you want to build credentials into with Kilt. Um, the reason you need to write those down is because they could be hacked. Um, if you email them to yourself, if you take a picture of it, I mean, all this is very extreme, however, um, it could happen. And so um, you need to store them in a safe place. So what's interesting is I used to work at um, an Ethereum project called Civil Media. It was a decentralized uh, way to syndicate and license uh, newsrooms. And so when we did our token sale, um, we went to, we had a KYC process and we also I had to teach a lot of mainstream users, news consumers, how to buy their crypto and participate in our token sale. And so I would take them through the process and I would explain to them that you need to write down your 12 words and you should then put them, maybe have two copies, maybe one is in your safe, maybe one is in a safety deposit box. Um, you shouldn't share them with anyone because someone can then take those phrases and put them into your wallet and then potentially use your credentials or take your money. So that's the weakest link. Um, it's not dissimilar to losing your wallet, that you would have to um, potentially lose the cash in the wallet. Um, you could restore your wallet and restore your credentials, but it would be kind of a pain in the neck, just like you have to call your credit card companies and cancel them and get the new one. So that's the weakest link. Um, it's consumer adoption, but it's also just learning a new skill, just like you back in the day had to learn how to set up um, to log into the old AOLs of the day. 
it's the same way that you need to learn how to set up your your phone when you get a new one. So it's it's a new technology, but I think it's also the more people become comfortable with it, the more people can understand what this next level can be in Web3, um, more people will try it. But again, it comes down to, again, simple interfaces, things that people can trust, that people can understand the utility for, and the things that are important to them in their daily life. Exactly. Um, Vaishali asks, I see on the website that you're working for the sustainable development goals. How do you ensure that uh, your blockchain product, products do not support illegal activities such as trafficking, for instance? Uh... So um, in terms of sustainability and the typical goals for um, Polkadot, I mentioned the carbon footprint and really being focused on that. And actually by design, um, Polkadot is actually a much um, lower transaction levels, fees, um, energy usage. So um, by virtue of its design, um, like anything, like any new technology, it could be used for anything. Um, and, you know, by bad actors, good actors. I do think that um, one of the steps we're taking, um, because certainly with DeFi, there can be bad actors. We want to make sure people are building products that are safe for consumers, that they are building, being fully transparent in what their products do, that they are actually building something, that they actually are not just fundraising um, and, you know, having people um, support them and then not um, coming through with the product. But that's one of the reasons we formed the alliance at Polkadot is to really keep um, quality projects and recognize them for the quality they offer and um, being trusted. And also to shine a light on the products and the projects in the ecosystem that might not be following open source standards and ethical standards, and then penalizing them and, and not uh, enabling them to join the alliance and also that other people are, are potentially aware that they are not the best partners. So that's our first step towards that direction. Wonderful. And I actually also have one more question for you, uh, Christine. You said that in order to use your services, you need to kill, right? Yes, yes. Um, of course, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, ask you to predict the future, um, let's say, price of kilt, but would there be a possibility and how would you like try to remedy that if let's say kilt would become uh, expensive, let's say, I don't, I haven't checked the supply myself, but let's say if it would go <laughs> to a large, uh, to mm -hmm. a large value, how would you ensure that smaller users that maybe would not be able to buy to kill for whatever reason, uh, if it is, let's say, uh, in the thousand, in a thousand maybe, or something like this, right? I'm just giving a random example. Yep. I don't know how much, uh, like, d depending on each person's wallet, right? But uh, how would you ensure that everyone would be able, no matter their uh, financial background, It's a good question. Yep. It's a very good question. And again, we want consumers and enterprise to be able to afford um, to buy a DID and to use it. And to also, again, have that predictable cost model for an enterprise when they begin implementing our technology. So um, that comes back to governance and the decentralized nature of Kilt and, and blockchain protocols that if um, for whatever reason, the, um, the price, the value of the token starts to increase in a way that becomes um, uh, an obstacle to adoption, uh, the community would have the ability to vote for a new price point. Um, or actually not a new price point, I'm sorry. Sorry, it's a little late here. Um, they would actually be able to say, instead of two kilt, it would be one kilt or half a kilt or a you know, 0.5 kilt. And so in that way, um, depending on the price fluctuation, it would still remain very affordable to use because we want folks to be able to use, um, to create their DID and to use it across more services. And then the more projects that build on kilt, I mean, that's the purpose of Kilt as a framework, as an infrastructure, right? We want developers, entrepreneurs to build, um, if they need an identity component, that we want them to use Kilt, and then their users potentially would then need a DID. So we want this to become, uh, we want there to be 10 million DIDs out there and for people to be using um, these services um, for ease of use and for new types of uh, projects. So yes, it is something we thought about and it would be something that the community could decide in order to drive adoption and usage that they could um, make it a different price point. Mm -hmm. Good question. 
Thank you, Christine. Uh, we're already five minutes almost over the time. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for uh, taking, as I said, time to uh, uh, give us a presentation, teach us what KILD does and how decentralized digital identity works. And uh, at this point, I would like to also thank the students for being here, there, um, for taking your time, of course, as well, to learn for something so useful. And uh, we're going to see you also again tomorrow. We're going to have uh, the how-to session on DAOs. So uh, thank you so much and uh, goodbye, everyone.